Good evening, everybody. We are now recording, and tonight we are meeting with the esteemed Bill Carroll. Hi, Bill. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Um, you know how I like to start? In, in, in two or three minutes, can you take us from nursery school to the present? Where were you raised? Where did you go to high school? Where did you go to college? What career shifts? What did you think you were going to do? What did you do? How did you end up with us tonight? How many minutes? Three. Um, Anyway, I was born in the Bronx. I grew up on Long Island. I went to, well, skip to, I went to uh, Catholic school. Uh, and then I went to Pratt. So I was at Pratt Institute from 69 to 73, studying painting. Uh, then I went to California. I was in San Francisco for the 70s and pretty much was working part-time jobs and painting, had a gallery at one point. In 1981, I moved back to New York and uh, immediately got a job at the Dia Art Foundation, and so, which was the, the beginning of me getting really sucked into more administrative jobs. Um, I was still making my own work. I would still show at nonprofits. Uh, but then in 1987, I took the job as the director of the Charles Coles Gallery, and, uh, which was you know, a, a sizable gallery. And that, once I took that, those are two hats that are very difficult to wear. Uh, to be the director of a gallery and to be an artist. So pretty much I would still make paintings, but very much for myself. And then I was the director of commercial galleries for almost 20 years. After Charlie, I was with Charlie for nine, almost 10 years. And then I went to Elizabeth Harris and she had a small gallery in Soho. And I helped her move that to Chelsea. And um, then I was with her for eight or nine years. And at that point, I just didn't want to sell art anymore. That had never been my original intention. So I decided to go, plus I really need, felt like I needed to get back in touch with making work as much as I enjoy curating and uh, you know, dealing with the, the artists in the gallery. I just felt this need to that would, you know, physically be making work that I liked as opposed to making a couple of paintings a year that I hated. So I went back to get my master's at Queens College, which was great. And then I came out and for a couple of years, I was working for the Nancy Graves Foundation and was teaching, of course, at Parsons. One of the things that, the fact that I had done all these different things, and immediately had a show with Elizabeth Harris, who I used to work for. She and her director had a spot open, they gave me a show, it was successful. So now I'm gonna have my fourth show with them in the spring. So now, right now I've got three jobs, which is uh, I'm running the studio program for the Elizabeth Foundation. I'm here four days a week. I teach a professional practice class at Pratt to graduate students, and I'm making my own work and, you know, trying to show. Did that, did that Awesome, do it? awesome. All right, I was in the Bay Area, and I had a gallery down the peninsula and moved to Chicago the same year you moved back to New York. I moved in 1981. Um, <clears throat> When, so when you were a kid, you thought you, were an, you, you, you intended to be an artist as an adult? I was always the artist in the class when it came time to, we had, something had to be drawn or there was something. Uh, like I won the art medal in high school, it was a very small high school. So I always thought I was going to be an artist. Uh, you know, I didn't quite know what that meant. And, uh, and I am an artist, I think more, more now. You know, as I said, it was a big chunk of time in the middle, I was doing other things. But I'm lucky, My, the whole thing has revolved around, I've always worked with artists, I've always worked uh, in the arts, and uh, you know, it's what I was always interested in, so I feel really, really lucky. Yeah, but one of the things that's interesting to me in listening to what you describe is that a fair amount of it has involved public engagement. Yes. And your art making does not, does not pu involve public engagement. You're not one, you know, you're, you're not one of the gorilla girls. You are, you know, um, you're not part of Pussy Riot. You are not out there doing <laughs> engagement art. No, no. My, I, you know, in terms of making my art, it is like most visual artists. It's being alone in the studio. But I think ultimately you're always, uh, it's all about communication. Even when you're alone in the studio, you're making something that you want to communicate. But in terms of like the social factor, uh, and that's really how I got sucked into uh, these administrative jobs, I was really good at the social stuff. As I said, I think I, when I was about 35, I was basically, and I knew all these curators and I was uh, you know, working in the gallery. And this is when I was still working. I was at the Brooklyn Museum, I missed that. So I went from the DR Foundation to the Brooklyn Museum. And then I went 
who started working for Charlie Calls. And that's when I really put my art on, on the back burner. But when I was at the Brooklyn Museum, I felt like I had these curators and friends of mine, I'd bring them over, and I just felt like I was not making very interesting work, but I was throwing really good cocktail parties. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of like the paintings, the cocktail parties. So in some funny way, it was like I was just really good at something else that um, I ended up doing, and which really took me, again, but it was still all connected to um, working with artists. The cocktail parties I was throwing was really... It was all visual arts, so uh, one way or another, I kind of stayed in that world. I want to throw in as an aside that we met with Miles Manning, direct, right. current director of Elizabeth Harris Gallery last week, right. and so there's an interesting continuity. And then just before you came on, um, somebody had asked a question. I don't, you know, I've learned a lot from doing this course now going on four years, um, and you know, like 250 guest experts like you. And there, but there remain some things that I have two, uh, you know, two thoughts about. And, you know, one of those is whether it's a good idea for an artist to have a straight job, another job, or whether an artist is better served by spending all of their time focusing on their art and their career. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. In these three jobs that you've outlined, what part of each job do you like the best? I like the social part of almost all the jobs. I'm just a really social person. And even in terms of me making my work, I found a way to make the work quickly, but I like the idea that it's going to be out there in communication. Uh, to me, it's all about we're, that we're all in this together. And uh, that kind of makes the most sense to me. So most of my the jobs, like this job now, I love when I get to throw the open studios and we have almost 3,000 people come through it. I get to be the host of this basically three-day party. I'm, at this point, I'm kind of tired of like the administrative stuff. I could lose that. All right, now, so professional practices is a lot like what this class is that I'm teaching that you're a part of this evening. Um, how do you keep it fresh? I keep it fresh by having new guests all the time so that I can ask different que you know, you different questions and I ask Miles. Um, how do you keep your teaching fresh? Well, for one thing, I haven't been doing that long. So I got, uh, when I came out of my get with my master's in 2007, the chair at uh, Parsons, they already had a grant from the Tremaine Foundation, which is a wonderful foundation that believes in professional practice classes for uh, graduate schools and will fund that. So they already had the funding. They had somebody teaching the class who didn't really want to teach it. Because I had done so many different things in the art world, the chair was like, you should teach this class. That's how I got sucked into it. So that's, you know, it's not that long ago. Then I did that for like three semesters, and then they went through a big change, and I was out. And then I, uh, the chair at Pratt, we hooked up, and we applied to the Tremaine Foundation, and we got the grant. I'm teaching the first professional practice class that Pratt's ever had. So, uh, so it's very fresh from the start. And again, and that's only now maybe I'm doing it for like four years, so it's going on four years. So for me, it's not like I've been teaching 20 years, I'm trying to keep it fresh. It still feels like I'm just still learning. So at this point, every semester I'm learning as I go. But I also bring in, uh, and part of the whole point of Tremaine is that I have the money to bring in guests. So I also, a lot of it is that I'm having conversations with people. And so, so far, it's fresh. As they say, every semester I'm taking notes like crazy. I'm just still figuring it out. Let's come back to this. Let's go back to the more original question or the one I posed earlier. Um, should, what should an artist do? I, I guess obviously the answer is there isn't one answer. But what are the factors that, you know, I mean, I think an artist often should focus on their career because there's so much more than an artist. To have a career, there's so much more than one person can do. You might as well spend all your time doing it. Um, what do you think? If you can afford to do that, I think any artist who uh, could afford to, if they were selling, if you're selling your work, any artist I know who's gotten to that point uh, of professional a career where they're actually supporting themselves with their art, yeah, you should be in your studio almost all the time. But I think there's a lot of artists who uh, have taught and always said that they really, even when they got to the point where they didn't have to anymore where they would you know, continue to teach because they did feel they really got something from it. 
So I, I think it really, and there are some artists who feel like they want to be engaged in the community in another way and don't want to be in the studio every minute. But the fact of the matter is, the more time you can put in on your art, the better. For one thing, it's not only putting, on, putting the time in in your studio to make the art, it's putting the time in on all this professional practice stuff. So that's a chunk of time. If you're really going to get your career going, you really need to be spending time on that. So yeah, the more time you have to spend in the studio and or working on your career, the better. But then there's always that matter of how you, you know, how are you supporting yourself? Yes. But my thought is, is that if you've got enough money to support yourself for a while, you can probably get your career up to speed enough there where it's providing support. Well, I think that's a tricky thing. Not all work sells. You can, you can have a great career. I know people are having great careers. They're having museum shows here, and uh, lots of things are happening, but they're not, still not making any money. That can be true. Yeah. I will say this, though. One of the things I tell my students, and again, even this, everyone's different. There are some artists who, when they, in terms of their day job, want their day job to be something completely different. And... Uh, you know, separate from their art world, from their, you know, their studio practice. I don't believe that. And, and I, I really think that whatever you do for your day job, the more it connects to your career as an artist. And that's just speaking from my personal experience is that as I've gone through the art world, basically I've been just becoming more and more a part of the community. And that, now that I'm showing my own work, has really... Uh, worked out that that's really helped that even though I was really in another situation as I got to know all these people but I think that if you're working if you have a day job and you're going to be doing some kind of administrative job why be in a law office when you could be working at some artist space or nonprofit space or a gallery where are you spending time all day long talking to artists and dealing with artists and meeting people in the art world so I think you know in terms of the day job if it somehow feeds into your uh, studio practice, I think that's a good thing. And I, okay. I think the corollary opinion is, is you, you know, like for many teachers, they're dealing with somebody else's aesthetic, and then they go home and try and focus on their own aesthetic, and it can be a challenge. Yeah. Um, maybe if, but, you know, the involvement that you're talking about in terms of the community, et cetera, I think is significantly important. And it's what I believe artists need to do to have a successful career is to grow their own community. Let's, let's take you as a case, case study as an example. Um, how many exhibits have, has your art been in in the past 12 months? Well, and that's the other thing, not that many, because I do it through other jobs. Right. So uh, in, the la- in the last 12 months, maybe, I think maybe I've been in two shows. And how did these shows happen? It was based solely on the merit of the art or it was based on a relationship or something else? Yeah, th- this was based on somebody I know was putting together a, uh, a show that my work fit into. But, but, it, 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 but it, became, it, it came about predominantly because they knew you and your work fit, not because they loved your art and they knew you. I, that's, I, 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 I'm not sure how that quite worked out, but... Uh, but I, I think that uh, as people were getting to know what I do, uh, like more than those opportunities are coming along. Like this week I have a meeting with someone about possibly doing a site-specific installation at uh, the Newtown Library. And again, that came through, I actually met the curator another way, through another curator. She looked at my work on uh, the gallery website. And, uh, but I met her through, actually through, uh, EFA and one of the curators I know that I brought in to do this studio business. So there's a lot of overlap. But at this point, I, I'm still somebody where the uh, me making art seriously is still really new. I had my first one-person show in New York just really like a few years ago. So what I what I'd like to do is to keep growing that part of my in terms of the different hats I'm wearing. That's the hat I'd like to be wearing more and more as I go along, and that I can afford to do it. I suspect uh, you have a reputation as being a really nice guy. And oh, really? <laughs> that's not a surprise. Oh, yeah. And um, obviously, you're not as nice as people believe you are, but, <laughs> you, but maybe. Um, 
the sense is that the New York art world is not as nice as you are. Um, do you feel that it serves you well to be a nice guy? Do you feel that it gets in your way? Does it distinguish you? I mean, everybody friggin' loves you, you know? I mean, it's, it's a really beautiful, it's a beautiful thing, you know? And it's nice for all of us to be sitting here basking in that sentiment. But how do you, how do you use that? Well, I think uh, the art world is a very tough place. And I think there are some people who are extremely driven and kind of humorless. And they're very hard to deal with. I've always taken this, I think part of the reason I have a nice guy uh, reputation is that I wasn't a careerist in, in, uh, as my primary focus, which is why I don't have like tons of money or whatever, that uh, I really like people. That's my kind of first interest. It's like people and art. I always tried to be in situations where I was really dealing with people. I always tried to be really clear and straightforward when I was the director of a gallery. Uh, like I really believe in communication. So I just do some like very basic stuff that uh, is not in any way extraordinary, but there are, uh, I'm in a situation where I'm being compared to some people who are very, very difficult. And by the way, some of those people are extraordinary and do wonderful things. And I think if I was less of a nice guy, if I really wanted to, you know, like have ended up with uh, some huge gallery or making tons of money or whatever, I think probably I would have had to be less of a nice guy. I have often uh, put the courtesy of other people ahead of uh, my career. So. But don't you think that as an artist, being a nice guy has served you well? It's my, it's work from my path. I think there are other people who've had to uh, operate in a different way. And some of those people are very successful and really brilliant. A lot of wonderful artists who uh, are, are really difficult or gallery people are really difficult. That's one of the things that I say to my class. So one of my, uh, like my approach to the professional practice is that having been the director of a gallery, it made me crazy that uh, I would deal with these artists who had no idea what we did and didn't think that they were supposed to know what we did. You know, that's the way people went through their MFA programs. Well, we don't talk about galleries, ooh, whatever, that, which was very wrong-headed. And I teach it that this is a community. You need to understand what the other members of the community do and respect them, which, by the way, is going to help you in the long run. The more you know, the better. But when I come to the end of the semester, so I bring in guests, and it tends to be people that I know, my part of the art world. And, um, you know, at the end, I say, you know, I was trying to give you an overall of how the art world operates and all these different people. But to some degree, I do them a disservice because I bring in all these really nice people. You know, that, that I, being a nice guy going through the art world, I've met other really, just, uh, you can go through the art world and really meet and deal with really nice people who are not uh, giving you a hard time. All right, let's turn it around now. So how do you, you make a determination about who should have studio space at the Elizabeth Foundation? I don't make a determination. We bring in an outside jury. So it's basically what? It's done by an outside jury. Do you so, sit in on the jury? Uh, I, but, I'm not, but I don't participate. That, I should qualify that. We do have some, sometimes we have studios that are free that are not part of the regular program. And then I'll be, you know, filling those with people, uh, you know, that I know where the people that come to me. But to become a member and have a subsidized studio, uh, you apply, the application goes up on our website in the fall. Last year, like 210 people applied and we could take seven people. So, uh, you know, so it's competitive. But I bring in five outside jurors and I try to really mix it up that I have a, uh, last year I had a critic, uh, the director of the museum, a gallery owner, uh, an artist. Uh, so it's like five art world professionals. And again, I really try to mix it up. And they look at the 210 people and tell us these are the, the ones that uh, you should choose. And then we do an interview process. And then you're in for two years. 
and then you go through a renewal process if you want to stay. And that process, we actually have three curators visit the studio. All right, but let's go back to the initial folks. How many people are you part interviewing? Well, I, I interview everybody that comes in. Yeah, so, so that is part of it. So, I, I mean, I do have that, the right to, uh, after the jury picks who's the best artist. But what, you said 105 they pick? Uh, no, they only, no, no, no. 210 people applied. They only picked, we took seven people this year. Seven. I know, but how, but how many did you interview for the seven spots? Well, that, and then what happened was we asked them to give us 10 finalists and like okay. six. And then we interview. And usually out of the 10 alternates, somebody's figured out they can't afford this even with the subsidy. Somebody else, something else happened. So we usually do get down to the, uh, and, uh, but I do do the interview that if I, someone comes in and I can tell they're just a complete nut and they're going to give us a hard time, you know, I can at that point. But I haven't really had to do that. Usually it's worked out that, uh, you know, the, the artists who get in here are one way or another from the first choice of the jury. What I'm trying to determine is if being a nice guy with the jurors or in the jurying has any say increases your likelihood by a fraction of a percent of participating or has no bearing whatsoever? I don't think it has any bearing. I'll tell you where being a nice wait, guy. Wait, wait, say that again? I, I don't think it has any bearing. Okay. But I was going to tell you uh, that uh, we're being a nice, I mean, there were times in the other room when I was uh, being the director of a gallery, they were artists, you know, lots of friends of mine were coming at me and I wasn't going to show their work if I go to do a group show. I mean, I can be totally, although I'm supposed to be nice, I can be completely ruthless when it's a matter of me doing my job. Yeah, I don't even know that you have to be ruthless. You know, I mean, if they're, if they're doing things that look like Maxwell Paris, you probably aren't going to include them. But, um, no, exactly. But let's just say I can be decisive, you know, that right. uh, it's, it's just a matter of doing your job. Okay. Um... Interesting. I'm trying to think about Charlie, you know, and I mean, Charlie was a nice guy, but he, he didn't have a reputation for being a nice guy. Yeah, Charlie, I got to really like, Charlie had a reputation for being very difficult because he could be, he could be very difficult with people uh, at times, including people coming into the gallery. Let me, let, me, let, me inter let me interrupt the spell. The, name, the person we're talking about is Charles Cole, C-O-W-L-E-S who is still alive, but not involved in the art world anymore, to my knowledge. And Charlie Cole's, as back history, Charlie bought Art Forum in 1965. It was one year old. It had been started by these guys in San Francisco. And as he always said, they had already come up with the square format. But basically, he bought this fledgling magazine. He moved it to LA. At one point, Ed Rouchet was his graphic designer. I mean, he was, he was Art Forum, he, you know, and then published it for over 20 years. If, you know, until he got into doing the gallery. Uh, but what were we going to say about Charlie? Oh, yeah, no, uh, Charlie, because uh, he could be difficult in terms of working for him, too. But as time went on, yeah, that was the thing. Underneath, he was a very nice guy, extremely generous. He just used like, to scare people. He had this big, booming voice. Kind of yeah, you're right. He did that. You know, until I got used to him, he scared me. And then I got used to him, and he was a nice guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's true. Um, If you guys, we could open this up for questions if you want. I mean, if you have a question, um, post it, you do, or butt right in. Um, a, a, a gallery tends to be, I mean, it tends to be a lot about the personality of the person who's in charge. Totally. Yeah, but I mean, like, when you were the director of a gallery, you're in charge, but you're not really in charge, right? Well, again, it depends on the gallery. So when I was the director of Charlie's Gallery, that was about me running his program. Although he did, he did let me curate shows. So every once in a while, he would, and when he let me curate shows, he would just let me do whatever I want. So in that way, it was great. But mostly, I was running his program. When I went in with Elizabeth Harris, Elizabeth had, uh, had the gallery for like five years, and she had been part of another gallery before. But at that point, she was really in a transitional place. So not only did I have a lot of input in terms of 
uh, finding the space in Chelsea with her, but I had a lot of input in terms of revamping the program. So I had a lot more say in what the program was at Elizabeth's uh, than I did at Charlie's. So I say it really depends. And then there are galleries that are, uh, I can think of one in particular, who uh, the woman who started the gallery still funds it to some degree, but really lets the directors at the gallery run the program. So it can be, you know, it can be a really wide range. Normally, it is the vision of one person, which is a big difference from a museum or any other institution. Leo Castelli Gallery, look at Leo Castelli. Once Leo Castelli died, I mean, they still have a space up on the Upper East Side, but it's not what Leo Castelli Gallery was. Sonnabend is a whole different thing since, you know, it's still going, but it's not, that what made those galleries great was very specifically their vision, you know, that they figured out, I just saw uh, the Warhol uh, murals that they took down for the World's Fair that they have there showing them out of Queens. Anyway, it was, I, I had forgotten that uh, Sonne, that Ileana Sonnabend showed uh, Warhol before Leo did. But it was, that's when she just had an incredible eye and that's why her gallery was so great. Totally true. But Tim, let's take a look at the private and the not private, the, the public sectors. I mean, I don't know that many people who've gone back and forth between gallery and museum and foundation and et cetera. Um, is it the it, same ball of wax or is it real different? Uh, there, it, there's, it's all similar, but there are differences. Obviously, that when you're in a commercial gallery and you're working for one person, uh, the, the galleries are really fun if it's going well. Because you, you make those decisions so fast, you know, you, you can just decide, oh, let's show, we have an opening, let's show this person next month or whatever. Museums move very, very slowly. So th they all kind of operate uh, in a different way. But the fact that the you're dealing with, well, Charlie said that to me when I started working, he was like, Bill, the art world is 500 people. And he meant it, and, I, and then I understood, like his mother was on the board of the Museum of Modern Art, was on the International Council, Basically, they would go on trips and it was like, there was this small group of really wealthy collectors uh, out there, the people who started all the museums, the Metropolitan, the Guggenheim, the, uh, the Whitney, the you know, the, uh, Museum of Modern Art. It's like basically uh, what I understood and whether it's nonprofit or whatever, is that there's a small group of people with the means to fund, there's, with, first of all, the people out there who really have money Somebody's buying polo ponies or race cars or whatever. You have this very small group of people who can actually fund all of the art world. And so no matter where I was working in the end, it is the same thing. You're in a gallery, you're trying to get those people in there to buy the work. You're in a nonprofit, you're trying to get those people to you know, come in and be on your board and give you money. So it, it's, it, there's a lot of overlap in that we're all uh, hopefully being funded by the same small group of people. I mean, the, the only thing I'll say teaching is different in that I'm just dealing directly with, uh, you know, the chair and, and other faculty and stuff. Otherwise, I feel like all those jobs, there's, there's a lot of overlap. Yeah, there is. How much, how much of the energy is about selling the art or raising, or raising donations versus growing the audience, you know, and the, and, and the long-term picture? Like, do I bring on... You know, does a gallery like Coles or Harris, do, would they want to have some, you know, fresh, young, new artists and some established, bigger name artists and some in between and some gay and some female and some of color and some, you know, from another planet? Um, you know, like, w w which of these are priorities? And again, that really depends on, you know, who's running a gallery. But certainly, like, at Elizabeth, I mean, when I got to Charlie, Charlie already had a vision and had a lot of established works. And a lot of what he uh, represented was actually, he was a bit ahead of the curve. But we would try, even Charlie, you know, he would try to like bring in some young artists and, and give them a show. And, you know, we really did try to mix it up. One of the things that galleries try to do, especially if you're a gallery and you're not way independently wealthy, but then you are trying to make some money, is that you, you have to, your uh, roster of artists, hopefully you have a couple of artists who really sell a lot. And if you have that, you can afford to uh, do some more experimental things. But even Leo Castelli, he showed, so he was showing Warhol and the Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg who were selling right out of the gate. 
But Cy Twombly, he showed Cy Twombly for years without selling. Salvatore Pistoletto forever. Right, right. So, I mean, you know, Leo had some people he believed in. And boy, certainly Cy Twombly, he was, couldn't have been more right about it. But, uh, but, he, 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 but he could afford to show those people because Warhol and, and Josh Jones were selling. So, you know, you try to build your roster that way. But yes, I think you're, uh, I mean, there's a big overlap in terms of building an audience and uh, getting funding or in the gallery having sales. You're trying to build an audience. Part of that audience, you want to be people who can actually afford to buy the work. But especially, I, I think with Elizabeth, that's where Charlie could get grouchy, who's a little uh, less into this. But with Elizabeth, we welcomed students. I loved it when, and other artists. You know, there's a lot of galleries that's like, oh, this show, only artists are coming in. We loved, like as, as we built an audience, and we, we, we really were doing a big painting program and or installation and sculpture that very often addressed painting. And so we really built an audience of, uh, you know, people who really loved what we were doing, people specifically who kind of loved painting and, uh, and I can remember like one show we did, this guy Scott Richter, who did these huge piles of paint on these tables. And man, I'll tell you, every painter in town, Jonathan Lasker, like all these people came in. I love that. You know, I love that we were building that audience, even if they weren't going to buy it. But some part of it was that we did also, part of that audience, somewhere in there, we were pursuing uh, curators and, and you know, collectors and people who could also do something. Let's talk more for a moment, then we'll open it up to questions. Um, what does the Elizabeth Foundation do? The Elizabeth, and by the way, there's no connection between Elizabeth Harris and the Elizabeth Foundation. I got everybody confused when I took this job. The Elizabeth Foundation was started in 1992 by Jane Stevenson and her son Guy Buckles to, uh, at first, to give out individual grants. Elizabeth was their mother who left money uh, Jane comes from the Stanley family. There's a Stanley Foundation that works with the UN, but her mother, that was the father's uh, foundation, but the mother left money for the arts. She and her son accessed that money to first give out individual grants. Fast forward 1998, they decided that they would uh, they wanted to do subsidized studios instead. They had gotten involved. ISCP was actually uh, part of this and funded by Elizabeth uh, Foundation for, for some part somewhere in there. And anyway, they decided they would do this uh, subsidized studio program. They bought the building we're in is a 1926 <laughs> New York 12-story uh, building. They originally bought all 12 stories and built out the studios. At some point, the son decided he wanted to do something different in Brooklyn, which he's doing, and they sold two floors. So now at this point, we now have 10 floors and now there's three programs. So there's the studio program, which I'm running, which was the first. I, again, because once they started the studio program, they stopped getting out grants. So the end of the grants, the beginning of the subsidy, uh, subsidized studios, that was in 1998. I think about seven or eight years ago, Robert Blackburn, who had a printmaking workshop he had started in 1947, uh, was ill and he wanted it to continue. So he came to the Elizabeth Foundation and, uh, and we took that on. So now in our building is Robert Blackburn for making workshop as a separate director, that's another program. And then I think about five or six years ago, they started, uh, we have a big space on the second floor and there's a, uh, it's called the EFA project space and there's another director for that. And they're doing very interesting, uh, kind of unusual program, very active with all sorts of stuff going on. So at any given moment, there's, you know, between, uh, well, at this, right now, we have like 103 artists in the building. Between the 77 members, they have, some of them have people sharing. <laughs> and for some of the studio programs, so forgetting the other two programs, the studio program, the goal of the studio program is number one, to provide subsidized <laughs> studio space so that there are artists who actually can still be in Manhattan which is extremely rare and is a really great uh, thing in that it's a lot easier to get, uh, we're blocks away from Chelsea. You want to get a gallery director over here, they can stop for a half hour on the way home. 
you, you want to get the same gallery director out to your studio way out in Ridgewood or Bushwick or whatever. That's the whole evening. So right off the bat, there's a real benefit to that. Uh, the building is all professional artists, so there's a lot of uh, synergy that goes on and a lot of relationships form and things happen with that. We have a program. We bring in curators uh, that the artists can sign up for. I recently had Barry Schwabsky and Linda Yablonsky and, uh, you know, we bring in some really interesting people, curators, uh, art consultants, so we brought in some gallery directors and gallery owners. So that's a good part of the program. So yeah, as I say, with the studio program, we try to keep it really active. We also do do uh, some professional practice stuff. You know, I've had my tax guy come in and tell, talk about taxes, et cetera, et cetera. How many artists have studios in the building? There are 89 studios. 77 of them are the studio members, the one who got, ones who got into the jury process. The other ones we rent out on a short-term basis, on a month-to-month -month basis. But the 77 who've been a part of the program, they tend to keep the studios for much longer than one year. They have it for two years, and then they can apply for renewal. Now, there are people who have it for the two years and do not get renewed, but there are, there's a small group of people in the building who go back almost to the beginning. Well, I think there might be a couple who go back right to the beginning. So maybe there's three artists in the building out of the 77, who have been here for 14 years. There's others have been, that have been 10 years. So there's some artists who really have managed to get through each renewal. And so we do have some people who've been here for a while. But I say, but of the, the 103 artists, so out of the, you got the 89 studios, 77 members, the rest are filled with short terms. But then some people do have shares. We allow them to share. So that's how we get to like, I say we're over 100 artists right now. Are there crits? Are there, are there ten other perks besides having studio space? Well, as I say, we bring in, uh, you know, we bring in critics and curators. Uh, but do they go to artist studios and perform crits per yeah. se? Yeah, if you want to call them crits, they go and do a studio visit. Okay, cool. And we we had to, try to have two or three of them a month, so we keep that really active. No, that's good. All right, let's go all the way up to Elisa and find your question. Um, Elisa, do you remember your question? It's the one you posed where it says 735. Let me find you and unmute you. Um, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Um, seven, I can't find Louder, louder. Um, am I unmuted now? You are unmuted, but not, you're not loud. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can get closer. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Um, I was just curious what the subsidies are structured like for the studios. The subsidies are each studio has four different possible subsidies, A, B, C, D. So depending on, it's based on your financial, uh, your income. If you're A, that means you're fully subsidized, you get the most money. So there are artists who have a 200 square foot studio in the building who right now are paying like $450 a month, which for New York, it, it, anywhere in New York is, is an incredible deal. And to be in the middle of Manhattan is like a real deal. Uh -huh. But you can like, for instance, uh, it's set up that way also that like, just recently I had an artist come down who uh, teaches, but she's gonna go on sabbatical. So suddenly her next year, her, her income is gonna be a lot less. And we took a look at it and we changed for subsidy. So it's also very fluid, depending, which is great for artists because maybe you have one year you make a ton, you sold a whole bunch of work, and you ended up being on a subsidy D. And the next year, you didn't sell so much work and we'll you know, switch you back to an A or, or, or B or whatever. It's a good deal. I lost, lost the feed there for a second. Um, I have one other question, uh, the one that he was referring to, I just realized. Um, so when you talked earlier about the funding being limited to 500 people, I, I just was curious how you introduce new work to them and appeal to their confidence in collecting this new work if, they're, if the work is untested in the market. Well, that, which is really difficult. I, I don't think people, I don't think artists or people in general realize how difficult uh, having a gallery is because you, you're selling stuff that nobody necessarily wants. And you can have an artist who did this body work that everybody loved last time and bought up like crazy. 
So that was your big money maker two years ago, and now you're showing that same artist and you're doing something completely different and nobody's interested in buying it. So, mm -hmm. it, it, which is why everybody is chasing those collectors. That's a, and, and I'm sure it's more than 500 people, but the concept of that really stayed with me with Charlie, which is basically, we're all chasing the same people with the resources. The mm -hmm. galleries are trying to get them in to buy your work. That the nonprofits are trying to get them in to donate money and be on your board. So it's, it's tough. And with the gallery of states, really, and the minute there's the least bit of any kind of recession or anything, it's the first thing people, they just stop buying. Mm -hmm. you know, so it, it's tough. But hopefully wow. what you do is try, you try and find, uh, I think all these are, you try and build a support system of people who really like what you're doing and are going to stick by you through thick and thin. Mm hmm Yeah. Thank you. But that support system, you know, each of these artists could have a support system of 30 plus artists, you know, 30 plus supporters in it. Right. And there's, let's say there are 50 people in the class. That makes 1,500 people, assuming there's not too much overlap, and none of those 1,500 are, are part of the 500 you're alluding to. Right. You're right. Okay. But, but we still talk about the 500 as if they're the whole thing. I mean, not, I'm not faulting you for that. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, as one woman we met with, Dana Martin Davis, um, talked about how there are lots of different art villages, you know, yes. and New York ha is definitely, you know, a number of art villages unto itself. Um, but, you know, I, I think that each artist can find their own success. They may not be able to find somebody else's. Yeah. I think they can find their own. Jeffrey, let me unmute you, Jeff, and you can ask your question. And others of you who want to ask a question, there's a bunch, but I'm having difficulty finding the ones I like the best and remembering where it is. Jeff, go ahead. Thanks, Paul. Um, Bill, I'm wondering if, uh, and I'm sure I'm not the only person on the line tonight who lives outside New York but tries to get there a time or two a year. Can we come visit? Is, uh, is it possible to get past security? Absolutely. Or come in and browse around and maybe uh, attend a seminar or two? Yeah. Um, I mean, the thing to do is when you get in New York, look me up and uh, make an appointment. In terms of seeing the studios, that's something, obviously, they're not open, but we do have, uh, we give tours all the time, and I have a whole list of artists who, even if they're not there, will let me show you their studio. So, uh, yeah, definitely if when you're in New York, I can, I can kind of give you a tour. Thank you both. Um, Bill, are there artists who have moved to New York because they received an Elizabeth Foundation Fellowship? Yes, uh, I have one artist uh, now. Whether he would have moved or anyway, I'm not sure, but I'm like thinking in particular last, uh, just last year, well actually last summer, we had an artist from South Africa who uh, had a career going in uh, South Africa, but really wanted to come to New York. And I think uh, the fact that he did get into the program uh, was a big part of him making the, the decision to come, that he was coming to a subsidized studio and right from that. So, uh, yeah, I think there were people, I think usually it's been where it's part of the whole package that maybe they're thinking of coming to New York and trying to figure it out and getting a studio here is often like the big push that uh, gets them to actually make the move. When, what happens to an artist who has studio space at the Elizabeth Foundation and gets really successful? They do a show, every piece sells out for over $10,000. There's 30, 40 pieces in the show. What, are they out on their ear now, or do they get to stay forever? What's the deal? No, uh, but it is a good question. At this point, we don't uh, make a judgment call on that. Uh, and a very often, artists who become that successful just kind of naturally move out, like they need a bigger studio or, uh, but we have a few artists in the building right now who are in fact achieving uh, you know, a certain level of success. And uh, now certainly they're at the highest subsidy, you know, they're, they're like they don't even, they're not even giving us their financials. And so we put them at the highest subsidy. But we do have one artist in the building who has reached, whose paintings are selling for $500,000. And it all happened very quickly, an older artist. And we're working it out with her that, I mean, it's to a point, she doesn't need the curators I'm bringing in. 
She certainly doesn't want to do open studios anymore. That's the one thing we really do require for the artists, that they participate in our open studios. So we're trying to come up with, like, what do we do? In the meantime, she loves being here and doesn't want to leave. So we're trying to come up with uh, another category of, like, master artist something. And she's offered to uh, make some kind of donation, like to give a painting to the foundation and make a donation. So we're now, we're now trying to figure out, uh, this is the first case we've had where somebody's become this successful in such a short amount of time. And we're trying to work this out rather than, I mean, one way to look at this is that the board could suddenly decide, you know what, artists are only allowed here if they only make up to so much money. But up until now, we've not, that, we've not done that. Okay, cool. Hey, Bill, some people are commenting that the qu sound quality is degrading. And they're oh, wondering really? if you could be a little closer and maybe we'd have a little less echo, but okay. it's, I'm doing okay. And I wanted to go to D. D, can you ask your question? Let me find you over here and um, unmute you. Um, hold on a sec. I was moving back. Let me know if that's... Uh, I don't know. We'll I'll find out. It was okay with me before and after. Go ahead, D. Um, hi, Bill. Thanks for talking with us tonight. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, um, how do you feel about artists that create in a variety of media? Um, do you prefer just a, like a single focus for an artist? I think that this moment in time is amazing in that you get to decide what art is. You know, it could be anything. Uh, I mean, the days of when I went to Pratt, Back in like 1969, you had you signed up. You were a painter, you were a sculptor, and now my students are doing everything. They're making paintings one day and a performance the next day, and I think it's great. Uh, I mean, I do think that if you are going to do performance art, or like I was thinking of one artist we had Elizabeth Harris who did these huge installations, and it's really what she did, and she shows them at museums and everything. It, it didn't make any money, and we could afford to have like one artist like that. So if you, are going, if you are thinking that you want to make a living off your art, you know, that is trickier if you're uh, with some mediums. But I don't think that should be uh, what makes you decide what medium you're going to work in. And I think right now in this moment of history, it's what's really fun about the art world, is that artists are really doing all sorts of uh, different things and, and feel no restrictions. I think it's great. Yeah, I agree with that. Paul, I want to go to your question. Um, and I've unmuted you. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I'm a, you know, I used to be a plasterer by trade. And I always thought if, if, you know, I went into a gallery and offered my plastering skills to help touch up their walls, you know, for free, <laughs> would that like help, you know, would that, I would just want them to at least see my work in person to get critique it? Or is that a good idea, you think? Well, I don't know about just going in and seeing if they'll let you plaster their walls, but I'm telling you, I know a lot of art handlers who, you know, and that's what I was saying about if you work in a gallery, you're meeting gallery people, uh, it, you know, it can't hurt. I know, I know of at least one, uh, I'm thinking of one guy who actually did end up showing with, with the gallery. Uh, but one way or another, you're in a position, uh, if you're an art handler, you're meeting all these people, <laughs> Almost like kind of a family situation. It's a lot easier to then say, "Hey, will you take a look at my work?" And I'm, I'm you know, I, I can think of so many art. Jim, uh, who was thinking, but I'm just thinking of all, there's a lot of artists I know who were art handlers, and I think it really did help them to, again to be in that community situation. You know, though, Paul. <coughs> sorry, one of the things I noticed, <coughs> I had one of my galleries at least 15 years, and the center of the wall was at least an inch thicker than the sides of the wall because of, you know, the repeated buildup of plaster. So that if you were hanging an eight-foot painting on the, on the center of that wall, it would want to rock back and forth. It would touch in the middle, but not on the sides. And, you know, I mean, if you were affable, if you didn't just storm in and go, hey, dude, your, war your wall is warped from plaster. Um, but, you know, if you were a nice guy, I'd want to do something nice to you. And if you wanted to do something nice for me, and still get paid, I'd be glad to look at your art to fix that wall. You know, I mean, I think it's part of the overall dialogue. Let me go to Sarah's question, which oh, I think I, is a I got another question. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, also, I, I went to school at Pratt, and I lived nearby, and I thought, 
you know, the type of work I do is, is very physical, but um, it's different than, than a lot of other artists have been trained. You know, I use trowels and plaster. Is it possible to get like an intern from Pratt who, you know, might be interested in doing this type of work and learning how to work with it? You know, I don't know. We, we use interns like crazy here at the Elizabeth Foundation. But again, we're a foundation. I don't know how, I know, but I know so many artists, even artists in the building who do have interns. Now, a lot of times I think it's uh, through people that they, uh, well, a few of them I know they teach, but I'm not sure how that works. I would contact Pratt and find out how, you know, if you, as an artist, and you want an intern, and ask them how they do it. I mean, maybe they send the word out. I don't know if there's somebody who's in charge of that, or it might be that they just send the word out that we have an artist who needs an intern, and they just have, like, like you know, send something to the students for them to make the decision. But I know we use, and very often I know the interns we have are former students from Pratt or my current students, and uh, we get interns from all over the place. And I think, it, you know, that's a great thing for an intern to work directly with an artist. It's, it's really terrific. Right. You know, I think in Paul's situation, having an art intern makes sense, but I also think for many artists, having an, art, an intern from the business school it can, be particu- right. can be particularly valuable. Um, so maybe that isn't coming from an art or design school, but you know, that, that for the re- not specifically to Paul's question, but to others who've thought about an intern, one from the business um, school is, could be a really good idea. I still want to go over to Sarah's idea. I didn't forget, Sarah. Um, hold on, I'm getting there. I'm scrolling. It's not too far south from Paul. Um, go ahead, Sarah. Hi, thank you so much for talking with us tonight. Um, My question has to do with public persona. Um, I'm curious about if an if an artist is uh, does things that are artistic, for example, a performer, um, but isn't necessarily high art. How much of that should be revealed to a gallery, Um, and would that would that work against? An artist. Well, you mean you mean like something that's like your day job that you're doing something. Yeah, I mean, I can you know, I I am a circus artist, and that's how I make money. And yeah. and so I just went through a huge um, kind of existential crisis, and like deleted my entire Facebook account because I people were getting me confused with my life goals, and you know, and I became known as Sarah the aerialist instead of Sarah the painter which is what who I am so right. um I, I you know not not to you know bring up the the gender thing but sometimes I feel like with male artists doing lots of different kinds of things and being kind of all over the place and having your irons and lots of fires is a an interesting and cool thing but as a woman sometimes I feel like I'm not taken seriously well, I think sometimes people are doing things like if your uh, circus performing in some way ended up informing your work, that can always be really interesting. You know, people love it when somebody ends up making some kind of work that's directly related to some other part of their life. But even even within the art world, I know so many guys who, uh, I'm guys because I'm thinking of them in particular, but I'm sure they're, no, actually now I've just thought of a couple of women who were in the same situation who came to New York to be artists, start writing reviews, got really good at it, got really famous at it, and you know, have really struggled to overcome everybody knowing them as writers. Mm. You know, I had to make this whole transition. Everybody knew me as the gallery director. Like when I first said I'm leaving Elizabeth Harris to go back to school, they were all like, to study art history? Then, oh no, no, I'm gonna go back and paint. You know, it was like a whole huge shift. But in the end, you define yourself. I mean, if there's some, in terms of, uh, if there's audiences that overlap and are getting confused, but it would seem to me that it's two very different audiences. I would think that as an artist, you're going to present yourself to a gallery as an artist. What, what else you do will come up later, you know, it, it, unless it is actually part of the work or informing the work. Just keep it separate, but I don't, I don't think see that it should be a big deal. And we also know a lot of artists whose day jobs ended up later on or eventually really informing your work. 
And I really feel that everything, all of my work is autobiographical. It's all, it's the only thing that I make work about and everything informs my work, everything I do. And, um, and just some feedback I had have received and, and it has caused me to kind of like whittle down my website is getting more and more minimal. <laughs> um, and so, but do you have like, the, do you have a separate website for this? Service? Not anymore. I'm, I'm, I actually, part of joining this class was part of my push to kind of distance myself. And luckily I did do a lot of it under stage names. But my question about the internet is because I have some things in like viral videos and things like that. And so if a gallery is considering me and they go and, and look me up and then find some thing that might be considered trite in the art world is that going to work you're, against you I mean, no, you're allowed to have, have to uh, like i'm thinking of a friend of mine who uh his day job was as a cook but he was really good and the next thing he's now got two careers going he writes cookbooks and it'll take six months he'll get a you know contract for and he'll write the, the cookbook book and then he does these like huge installation pieces in the <laughs> And then he'll get enough money and then he spends six months, whatever. And he keeps them going absolutely equally. And no, none of the places he's showing his artwork are going to say, oh my God, you're writing cookbooks, you know? Right. As it seems to me like uh, he's just operating in two separate worlds. There's actually really no overlap. But there's no gallery that's going to be upset that he has this other, uh, you know, this other career going. I mean, galleries, everybody understands that artists have to find a way to make a living. It's part of the deal. And if I can do it in any way with it that involves creativity, that's the way. Yeah, right, exactly. You know, including dog portraits. <laughs> <laughs> that's very creative. You know, I think a lot of this stuff, I relate, Sarah, to, to dating, and as I've mentioned before. You know, and if you have, you know, you have seven toes on your left foot and three on your right foot, that's probably not something you share in the first 15 minutes of your first date. Or if you do, it's obvious that it's significant to you and it's something that, you know, helps define who you are. You know, once you and this other person are in love and you really appreciate each other, and by the way, I have seven toes on one foot and three on the other, they go, okay, cool. Um, what were we talking about? Um, you know, and, and, and the conversation continues. It just adds, you know, a little bit of substance. Um, I don't know. That's how I see it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, that's interesting. I'm reading Harley's comment. Harley, go ahead and ask that of Bill, but I have to unmute you first. Um, hold on. That's taking me a long time, isn't it? All right, Harley, I've unmuted you. Uh, is this the question about being more yourself? Or yes. The question? Yeah, uh, Paul said, hi, sorry, I'm from Australia. Hey. Uh, Paul said, it's important to be yourself, but to also be uh, more yourself and don't all, doing all these different things in our social lives outside of our art, uh, don't they add to us as an interesting artist? Or is there a line that we should be saying, this is us as an artist, but this is slightly separate, or this is completely separate? You know, I, ha I had a little trouble hearing you. Could you just... Uh, I I'm encouraging people to be themselves and to be themselves some more. And Harley's asking... Yeah, okay, does he really mean that? Or is there a line where being myself is too much myself and I'm supposed to hedge a little bit and control what I put out? I think the whole point that we're all striving to be as much ourselves as possible and to be as original as possible. Uh, that doesn't mean you can, uh, you know, be rude or... Uh, I think actually there are sometimes... The only thing I'll say where you don't want to do that is where I have had artists who think that it's their job to be unbelievably aggressive and rude and somehow they got confused that that's part of the job of being an artist, that you should just be incredibly demanding and whatever. That, that you don't want to be that part of yourself. Uh, you know, there's matters still count. But otherwise, yeah, I think you should experiment as much as possible and, and uh, 
I just read a great uh, interview. It was actually in 2013 with Roberta Smith and Jerry Sauls. And Roberta was saying that uh, she feels it's like fingerprints and, and, you know, our, and our handwriting that we're all you know, amazingly original uh, from the get-go. It's like, you know, getting that to a point where you're actually making art that is as original as you are and that really states who you are, it, it's, 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 it's really a lot of work and it's really hard. But yeah, I think you definitely uh, should go for it. Cool. Um, somebody asked a question, made a comment, <clears throat> I forget who, and then I want to go to Ted's question. I want to let Ted be the last question. Uh, and said, you know, a lot of the artists, somebody said a lot of the artists she knows um, who live in New York City are leaving New York because of the high rents and that perhaps New York City isn't the art capital it was a year ago and that that may be something that's continuing. What do you see? You know, people love to like claim gloom and, gloom and doom uh, about New York, but I do think it ha is a real problem, and people see it as a crisis, that it's, it is more difficult to find studio space, uh, which is why places like <laughs> the Foundation exist. And I see also, if you come to New York, there's more and more residencies, uh, there's more and more organizations that are trying to address this, and and make studio space. And I think there are artists who are leaving for that reason. On the other hand, artists are still coming here in droves. Um, all my students in, at Pratt, usually nine out of my 12 students are from foreign countries, and uh, they want to stay here. They all have me writing letters trying to get some visas and whatnot. So New York's not over. I thought uh, Robert Smith did, every year they do a gallery issue of the in the New York Times where they really cover the galleries. And you know, like one critic will go to Chelsea, one critic will go to the Lower East Side, one critic will go to the Upper East Side. And, and Roberta said, she said, you know, everybody likes to talk about that New York's not the center anymore and it's going downhill. And then she just said, there were like these 300 galleries just in Chelsea. There are, I mean, good contemporary galleries. She basically said, there's, at this point, there's no place else in the world. If you're just gonna talk about galleries, there's no place else in the world that's even competing. So for the moment, New York is still the big marketplace, the big center, and there's still artists coming here. But I know artists who have left and are leaving because it ain't easy. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's one thing when you're young and you're trying to get started, but I do know artists who've reached, reached mid-career, they're still struggling, can't afford a studio, and I, I know a lot of artists who are, who are leaving. I don't think it's easy anywhere. Ted, let's go to your question, and you're unmuted. Go ahead, Ted. Well, that sort of leads up to my question. So if we're all uh, chasing after the same 500 people, and I've heard uh, other people say the same thing, that the art world is made up of 500 people, that the, uh, uh, the movie industry is also made up of a small number of people, um, where does an artist need to be located if we're trying to, you know, make contacts and meet people, where are the important places that are, should be and need to be? And there are some limitations to that. If, if New York is the place, New York's a pretty expensive place to sort of live. I think New York is someplace you want to be shown. It doesn't mean that you necessarily need to live here. But, and by the way, that whole 500 thing, uh, that was really just about, in terms of like at a commercial gallery, in terms of who we were gonna to get to make the money. You can have a career in the arts. There's lots of different ways to have a career in the arts and be part of a different community. I personally uh, am very big on the community aspect of it. Uh, so to me, to move to some town where there's literally no other artists and nobody's interested in art would seem to me to be isolated. But it doesn't mean you have to come to New York. I actually, the director of the Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop uh, is just moved to Asheville, North Carolina, which is a smaller place, but has a vibrant art scene going on. Uh, there's some kind of residency place nearby. Uh, he's, he's starting his own business, consulting with nonprofits and with artists, but also he's gonna continue to publish prints, and he's gonna be doing it in Nashville, North Carolina. And he was here with his wife for eight years, and it's just gotten to the point, they can't 
by like they wanted to buy a building and it just became impossible. Whereas they just bought this great house in uh, Asheville and you know they're ready to have kids and do all that stuff. But uh, but I do think and I and maybe this is just me, but I would need to if I leave New York, I need to go someplace where I feel like I have a community of people who understand what I'm talking about and. Uh, because the visual arts is a tiny little thing. You know, most people out in the world, that's the whole thing about 500 people is that basically uh, the whole populace supports the movies. Visual arts, general people are not coming into galleries and buying art. You know, so that's why we're chasing after, we're chasing after this small group of people who have the money, can afford to do it, and want to do it. I say, if you're, you're going to make a commercial movie, man, you've got the whole world is going to. Is, is a you know, potential audience for you and potential uh, supporters financially. But, you know, I say we're in a different, it's a, kind of a different thing. But it is, it's, but it is big, it's bigger than the 500 people and there's lots of different ways to make it go. And, uh, but I personally think it's important to be, uh, you know, someplace. Like when I lived in San Francisco, there was a great, uh, it's a small city, but there's a great art community there. But if you want to connect with the New York art community, how does one do that that's not there? Do you connect with you know, galleries in your area and then those connections are sort of made because of the similar interest because those villages sort of connect? I mean, that's really good, a good way. If you, you know, first of all, you know, get yourself known in your community. And uh, then if you have a track record showing with the gallery or whatever, wherever you are, that as you approach New York, the more that it looks like you're, uh, you know, pro already uh, is, is a really good thing. And then you do the usual thing of uh, you do your homework. If you're looking for a gallery in New York, really look up the galleries uh, and, you know, find places that you think you really fit into and then find ways to follow up on it. I mean, I know galleries that uh, one of the, I bring in Steve Sergiovanni, who's the, the uh, director of Mixed Screens Gallery, which is uh, over in Chelsea, which is a really good gallery. And they actually do uh, portfolio reviews for once, like one, I think either once or twice a year, where you, you can send your work on solicited. Like not all the galleries are totally impossible. That, you know, there are ways you can, but the first thing is whatever community and is to make sure that you've, you know, become a visible part of that and then take it one step at a time. And New York's hard. Uh, like the South African guy who came uh, last year that I was talking about, who came partly because he had the studio. Like he got here and he was complaining. So I sent emails to 50 galleries and da da da, like, and nobody answered it. Like he thought, yeah, he, like, you don't get it, you know, like, like he was from a kind of a smaller situation. The idea that he could email that many people and it's like, whoa, you, you know. in the meantime, he slowly but surely has found his way in. And as a matter of fact, uh, the director of Jack Shaling Gallery, which is a really good gallery, uh, we had a show up, we put work up in our offices here, and we had a work up by him and somebody, the director of Jack Shaling came in, she really wanted his work. So the next thing he's got a visit from the director of Jack Shaling Gallery. But it had to happen that he was here, he was present, his work was up, you know, you got to be putting yourself out there in whatever way you can. And certainly all the nonprofits here, you can approach from, I mean, they they love to, to get artists to places like White Columns, Artist Space, and Nurture Art. There's all these great nonprofits in New York. If you can get, that are aimed at showing artists who are not represented, uh, who, you know, I think are really happy to be showing artists from all over. And then you, you know, that, then you have work up and people see that work, you know. I go to those shows, galleries go to those shows. Thank you. You're welcome. Good response. Bill, thank you very much. Let me, I, I, we're, we're done. That was awesome. I really appreciate everything you had to say. That went by kind of quickly, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, that, that really goes fast. It does go fast. Um, let me unmute everybody and they could all thank you in unison and echoing. All right, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank